There are also all of these informal aspects of a conference where like we had a gathering of all of the women at the conference um, last night and it was really nice and I made some new friends. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that you would miss if you weren't in person. You guys seen the, the movie The Graduate and the drunk relative comes up to Dustin Hoffman him, you know, you're about to go out into the world. I'm going to tell you one word, something really important you need to know. He tells him plastics. <laughs> yeah. So I had a similar experience of a drunk shirt tail relative came up to me at a party and said, whatever you do in college, take linear algebra. I couldn't fit it into my schedule. So I, I figured I would figure it out and learn from it. I'd con my girlfriend into taking the class. I didn't learn from it. She, I think she did, though. But uh, a lot of 3D graphics is driven by linear algebra. And it doesn't it all look linear, and it doesn't it all look like algebra. It's a lot of matrix multiplications. Pretty simple stuff, really. So... A uh, couple of caveats here. I am not trying to sell you the library I wrote. This is not the way that you would want to do it. That you'd go out and buy some off-the-shelf library and have it do all the manipulation for you. This is so I could learn how the internal mechanisms worked. All the matrix multiplication, the graphics, the rotations, and then actually how to go down and rasterize every single pixel that you're drawing. And so that's what I've done. And there's a couple flaws in what I have that I didn't bother fixing, and I'll show you what the issue with that is too, and tell you a little bit about that there is a fix and work around for it. Okay, to draw something that looks like it's 3D and smooth surfaces and stuff, we really don't draw smooth surfaces. You draw lots of triangles, and you make them look like they're smooth. And so there's your triangles. Triangles are made up of edges and vertexes. And I'll explain in a little bit why triangles are important as opposed to drawing it with other shapes. So we keep track of the vertexes and edges are just lines that connect to uh, vertexes. Vertexes are the coordinates that we're in. Whoop, wrong way. These pictures of all the triangles and you plot out all the different points and you have lots of triangles. Something which becomes important later is where all these triangles meet. That's the same coordinate in multiple different triangles. So you don't actually have to calculate this for every single triangle. My mechanism pools those together, and you only have to calculate those points once, and then when you ask for what those coordinates are, it goes and gets them out of a little pool of what it knows it had rotated them for, through for. So here's another example of how you make something look pseudo-smooth with triangles. The more triangles you use, the closer the actual shape is that you're drawing. And the more surfaces where you can apply different textures. Textures are also a graphics name for, uh, it's not really textures, but just surfaces and pictures you put on there. You can, many times there are fancy methods of applying uh, actual texture type effects. I'm, I didn't bother with any of that. I'm also not bothering with light sources. And what you would normally also do is on the vertexes, you, that's where you would actually calculate your light sources, what their effect was, and then interpolate along the edge what the light effect was on all the points between there. So here's the classic teapot you've probably all seen lots of pictures of. Here again, it's square, the wireframe. That's not easy for us to draw. And if you, the issue, reason is, if you have four points, the four points may not be on a plane, and you don't necessarily know how to bend that shape to fit on your plane. So we do triangles, and you can simulate curves a lot easier. So here's a three, you remember your old you know, junior high uh, geometry, three points to find a plane. You're guaranteed that the space between there will be flat. Even if you want to draw a curved object, you just do enough triangles together and you can simulate a curve. So a model 
is an object that you would be put placing in your screen or in your world. Um, we only really care about the surfaces. We don't care what the inside is made of. As far as we're concerned, it's just empty void space. This graphic happens to show a shadow effect on the side that doesn't have the light on it. But each side, each shape that you, or surface that you paint on there has ups and fronts and backs. So since we're drawing triangles, we can't draw squares, you divide that up into a whole bunch of different triangles and you wrap it around. And the image or the texture that you put on there, you cut into a triangle and you paste it on that space on the front. The other half of the triangle would go on the other half. When you go, you have your surface, the, your texture you're going to put on there, there's an order of the points as it goes around of how it maps to the order of the points on the square. If you do it the wrong way, the word look, the image will look backwards. And there's a right hand rule that if you twist your fingers in the direction that the points go around your shape or your, your, your surface, the, your thumb will point in the direction that's up. And if you look at the cube on the side where the blue line is, that surface would be the up, the thumb would be pointing into the cube so the up looks backwards. On the uh, greenish line, a little bit hard to see, up is upright or facing outward because when you curl your fingers through the order of the points, it points out. Okay, a model is basically a collection of polygons, triangles, and we, every model has a matrix that would place it in the world where you want it to be. And when I say matrix, we'll kind of get into that a little bit later. We combine multiply matrices together to rotate it to the position you want, scale it to the size you want, transpose, and scale, and strict, all kinds of different stuff. And you can use that, you multiply that matrix, your, mod, your model points by your matrix, and each one of those points becomes in, in the world of where you're going to want it. So we go from model space to world space to view space to screen space. And each one of those is a step in matrix transforms. So model space, your object has its own origin and axes off of that. Many times people will put the uh, origin at the very middle. Sometimes, you know, if you're drawing like a person figure, you may want to put it at the feet so it's easier to line up. Um, something else that some graphics people tend to do is keep every model in a scale between zero and one. That way you can scale it easy. And so even if you have a really big object or really small object, you keep it in that scale. That way it's easier to deal with later. You don't have to worry about what the original size of the object was and know this object is going to grow by twice as much and this one's going to grow by four times as much. World space, your world that you live in has an origin and you place multiple copies of your model in that world. In the view space, the view is, has its origin and you know, you got your typical X, Y, and Z and depending on which system you're using, it's either going out of the screen or into the screen. Each different uh, gaming engine or graphics engine has its own way of dealing with coordinates and the axes and which way they go. Uh, you just have to figure out yours when you go to use it. Mine, the Z is out of the screen. Or is it? Yeah. Screen space is from the perspective of the camera or your eye looking at something. It has kind of a coordinate system. This one, the Z is going into the screen X is across and Y is down or up. Um, and you only really want to look at a certain depth of it. Uh, objects that are too close, you don't care about. Objects that are too far, you don't care about either. So you get a kind of a front and back clipping plane where you ignore anything outside of those ranges. Um, so after you put something into a series of objects into the world, you actually need to be able to get the perspective on it such that certain objects, you're skewed in your orientation of where you're looking at it from, and it kind of pitches it up. And so you can see the depth in the back layers of it. 
a little bit about points and vectors. Um, not super important, but you need to kind of know how these work. Points are just plain points. Vectors are the length and the direction without necessarily any reference to the actual origin. Um, and there's some math that's involved in those later, but just something for you to know. Points, because of the way we're gonna do matrix multiplication later, we needed to have a point system. We have X, Y, and Z for both points and vectors, but to keep the math straight, and when you do matrix multiplication in the right size of the vector, you're going to multiply your point by your matrix, which is a four by four. It needs to have four dimension or four coordinates in it. So points are normally indicated with a one in the in the y or in the w digit position and zero for vectors. That's just a way of keeping them straight. I have classes that differentiate between them. Other graphics engines aren't as good about that. So after you go through and you do your uh, matrix multiplication on a point or vector, you can still see what it was when it went into the equation. You get the one in the back out. So two vectors you can add to make a third vector. So you're kind of up and over. Uh, and, and these are commutative. It doesn't matter whether you go up and over first or with the order you add them in. For my talk, I'm going to be skipping these subjects, uh, which aren't really, they're useful but not applicable for what we're doing here. I won't even bother to mention them. If you want, you can look them up. So I have multiple different classes that I support, of vectors, points, matrix, and a mesh. A mesh is my own term of what an object is. It's a collection of polygons or triangles. Um, and vector operations for vector math, you can multiply a vector by a matrix and it does whatever appropriate scaling or rotating you need to do. And I have both the infix notation and the asterisk equals form. Um, if you multiply a vector times a vector, it actually, it does an internal, it does a, what's called a dot product. We don't use it, but my library has it. Normalizing is when you convert everything to a unit length of one. Uh, so if you wanted to compare two different vectors, for example, and one of them's really long and the other one's short, if you normalize them both, then it's easier to do math on them to figure out if they're pointing in the same direction or opposite or do reflection on them, that stuff. Points are very much like matrix or like uh, vectors. You multiply by matrix. Uh, you can uh, add a point, a vector to a, a point and take your point from here and move it over to here. It's the same way you could subtract two points and you get the vector between them. Uh, a matrix operations, you ma multiply a matrix times a matrix and it gives you another matrix. That's nice, it ate the M on my matrix on the uh, left side there. Um, mesh operations, since they are just a plain collection of points and, and of polygons, when you multiply a matrix times a mesh, it goes through every single point that's in the mesh, in the polygons that are in there, and does the transform to each one of those. Sounds expensive, it's not really too bad. Matrix multiplications are pretty fast. Meshes, you can take multiple of them and add them together. Say that the world I call a mesh, and each model is a mesh, I can just add all these meshes together and it becomes my world that I'm dealing with. So each one of the, your models, you would rotate in place where you wanted to, and it becomes a big world. So, um, matrix is just basically a plain four by four array. And because of some circular references of needing to do math on each other, you can't use them and declare them out of order. Um, so it was easier for me rather than putting a friend operator multiply, friend, you know, operator, you know, multiply equals. Um, I actually spell out the word here, and later I declare global operators that take a matrix and a point or whichever ones they want. A data four is a four coordinate, 3D coordinate that is either a base, it's a base of a point and a vector. And it was simplified some of my math later. But I further derived from them later so I get type safe. 
one of the guys that I learned some of the graphics from, he was confused a little bit on it and always having that one in the zero in the last digit. And he couldn't keep them mathematically type correct of operators. And I wanted to prove to myself that it was possible. So I do keep everything in type correct. That way, if you, it's going to protect you from trying to multiply the wrong types of objects together or trying to subtract uh, two incompatible objects. So there I get my vectors and points that are type safe. And notice the vector has a, the fourth parameter, w is a zero, and a point has a one. A mesh, I explained, was a collection of polygons. When I have a, my whole set of triangles with the coordinates on the vectors, and I go add them into the mesh, I, I remember every point that's in there, and I add it to a, a vector of points. And so if another object comes in and adds a point at the exact same coordinate, I just reuse that index in the vector rather than do the math on it yet an additional time. It, uh, because if you have an object that has hundreds of polygons on it where they all meet four or five together, I, I keep using polygons and triangles interchangeably. I hope that's not bothering people. Um, that you don't have to redo that math 10 times for all the different objects that come together at that corner. Here's my flavor of global operators, how they read. And internally, when I uh, take a vector times a matrix and multiply it, 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 it calls the uh, vector operator or vector method for multiply. And the uh, same as if I'm doing a plus equal or a times equals or if I'm uh, multiplying two vectors together, do the cross product, yada, yada, down the way. But these are, I, so I declared my cl uh, classes that have all these, the spelled out name operator for them, and then later do global operators. And the only reason to do that, as I would mentioned before, because of some of the circular dependence of the names, that way I can declare all the classes and then the operators later. If I tried to do it in place in the class using the friend operator, it would say it's trying to use a unknown forward reference. And I mentioned meshes of the collection of points. We have the model, which is your object you're going to be placing there. Is this a collection of points or polygons? A world is a bigger collection of more points, and it has its own origin, and it knows about that, and depending on how you treat it. The screen is yet another flavor of a mesh. You can add multiple meshes together, either just by saying plus to two meshes, or you can assign your mesh by adding it into another mesh. And you can multiply a mesh by a matrix, and, and as I mentioned before, it goes through and iterates through every point in the collection of meshes, or of, of points inside your mesh. And you can either do that by taking an existing mesh and multiplying it and storing the result or modifying your existing mesh because you didn't care about keeping extra copies of it around. So to manipulate and move things around on the screen uh, or in your world, you just basically take a matrix, which was generated, and I'll show you some of these formulas here in a little bit, of, and you just basically say, I want to rotate on the x-axis this many, and I use degrees. Most systems actually internally use radians. Doesn't matter just as long as you're consistent and you use whatever engines system that you wanted to use, or that they were using. Rotate on the Y, rotate on the Z. Scale, you can scale things differently in different directions on the X and the Y and then the Z. So you can start off with a cube and end up with a funky, you know, you know rectangle type gone. Translate is just moving on the x or the y or the z axis or some combination to get to a particular point. Point of view is a matrix that will convert you from where looking at a point from a, another point basically does translates the entire axis system such that instead of looking at it just from straight in front, you might be way up in the corner. A field of view uh, takes what you're looking at 
uh, the view angle, the aspect ratio of the window you're drawing into, the, the near plane and the far plane, and does a lot of math on that. But it's just a plane matrix multiplication that does that conversion and clipping on that. Screen transform is when it basically takes a 3D set of objects and flattens and squishes them so that your X and Y or what your X and Y will be on the screen. The uh, Z coordinate is a funky scalar that then you have to go through and do a, a divide by. And that uh, does some extra squishing on the X and Y and then actually gives you a, a depth. Apart from me, I actually said you divide by the Z, you don't, you divide by the W, which is a number that floats through in the system. A matrix multiply, you may remember this from seventh grade, eighth grade math. And there's the, by color coding, you got, this is a vector, for example, your vector with your X vector, Y vector, Z vector, W, by your matrix by one by one, one by two, one by three, and you multiply it out. The length of with the matrix, your multiple, your input matrix, because a, a vector is a matrix and so is a point, has to match the length, the, the length of the number of coordinates has to match the height of the matrix. Since all of our matrix transforms are four by four, when our, our point or vector goes into it, it has to be a, a by four size which is why we had the padding of the one and the zero. So scaling just stretches, and it's very simple, X, Y, and Z in the diagonals. Uh, translation is moving on an axis, and that's just an X, Y, Z across the, the bottom row with the identity di on the diagonal. Rotation, and this is for Z, you're looking down the z-axis and it rotates around the z-axis. That's the little picture shows there. Uh, the x rotation, and you can't see it because we would be looking in the x-axis, so it's twisting this way. So. And y is like from the front view, it's not, you're not really seeing it. Okay, so we talked about our coordinate spaces earlier, and you've seen this slide already. We go from model space to world space to view space to screen space. And here's the transformation pipeline. You have your model, you multiply it by its matrix that is the combination of the rotation and the translation and the scaling, and you add that to the world. And you may have many, many uh, models you've added to your world. And then you multiply it by a view matrix, or the, the, which is your view that you want on that data. You, with the camera space and you multiply it by the projection matrix and, and then you, you do some, op, some clipping, which is optional, and then the uh, uh, multiply by a, a, this, the thing that squishes it into 2D coordinates, whoops, and gets it into uh, what they, some people call a homogeneous screen space. And then here's a divide by W, which is kind of a magic step, which does some scale, perspective scaling, and all of your X, Y, and your Zs become more readable, I'll just put it that way. Okay, so we talked about the world matrix. If, if you have an object that you want to rotate, for example, 30 degrees, the translation, you move it 100 on the Y, Rather than even multiplying every single point by your rotation matrix and then by your translation matrix, you can just multiply them together up front, which then gives you a matrix that you only have to multiply across all your sets of points once. This saves a lot of extra steps. And on the next slide we'll see here a example of why the rotation, the, the order that you multiply these together is important. Matrix multiplication is not commutative. If you have an object and you rotate it and then you translate it, slide it over, that's entirely different than sliding it over and then rotating it because you're not rotating it around that object anymore. You're rotating it around the origin of what that object is related at. So it's basically you moved it over and rotating around this matrix 
or around this origin, so it's shifting up. So it, the order of them is entirely different, even though you're doing the same operations on them, just in a different order. So the multiply math order is basically straight left to right. If you have a vector and you want to multiply it by matrix one, two, and three, normally a, a left to right would be times M1, times M2, times M3. But if you take M1, M2, and M3, multiply those all together, make a term M, you can just do your vector times a matrix. And that's basically the same thing. And if you have a hundred or a thousand vectors to be doing this to, or points, um, it saves a lot of extra multiplication steps. So this is a screen, the slide we just saw already about your positioning, pre preparing a matrix to position your model in the world. So the view matrix takes into account uh, the, the position the camera's at, your perspective that you want to look at it, uh, the camera target, so it doesn't actually have to be the origin, but you could say, I'm going to be up over here, and I want to look at this in this direction. You also have to deal with, when you're looking at that direction, so pretend my finger's a pointer, my thumb is the up direction. If I tilt my head, I'm going to look at things sideways. This will do the exact same thing. When you move your up angle, it looks at the screen sideways. And from wherever my point of view, my camera position to whatever point I'm going to be targeting at. And in my demo of the little app I wrote, I'll show you how that looks from many different perspectives. So when, and this is kind of a graphical view of changing the origins from your camera's out there floating at this point, and you do the transform into a view space, now your camera is the new origin and your object is floating effectively out in space from whatever perspective the camera had. And this kind of is, we saw this slide already. Some people call it a fristrum. I don't know why. I, there's probably a reason for the name of the term. Um, and you got your field of view in your front and your back. Okay, creating the view matrix, it goes from, it is, this is it from your point of view and the camera position, your camera target, and your can, camera up. So, the thumb and finger that I showed you a minute ago. Um, you also have the projection matrix, which is the field of view, your aspect ratio. Because if things are outside your aspect ratio, it's different for a real small screen versus a real wide screen. And then your plane and far plane, and this just does the magic for clipping that. And here's the math on a simple view of that. And you, this does a bunch of internal math and doing a couple different uh, cross products. And it calculate the matrix that would spit, be spit out in this example is would be your four by four would be you'd multiply to get your perspective. And your viewport, more magic matrix. The divide by W goes through and does some scaling on the X, Y, and the Z. And because this was a point you started with before all this operation, when it's all the way done, because we did the divide by W, the, the last term, the WS, if it was a point, it's one. If it's a vector, it's zero. So even though the W was became some funky numbers in middle steps, it comes out in the wash and it's back to a one or zero, it's a point or a vector. Okay, we already talked about the matrix math multiply. This is important to save a lot of steps in a lot of extra CPU cycles. And we, okay, image depth buffer. This is how you figure out when you draw something that's what's in the front and what's in the back. When you've calcul, when you go to paint a particular pixel, you check its depth against what was already painted. So you have this depth buffer, and if the depth on what the point was at that other point, which is simulated or drawn, the darker the color, the closer. So if your new point is lighter or further away, it's hidden behind something, you don't draw it, you just ignore it. 
If it's like, if it's, if you've drawn something that's already there that's far away and you your new point is much closer, you, it, it paints over what was already there. So you build up this layer after layer and you're doing this off screen in a buffer and then you would just blit it onto the screen. Oh, by the way, I'd say blit, that's a Windows uh, terminology typically. All these techniques are agnostic. My demo, it happens to be a Windows app. The only thing it really uses the Windows for is the shell that runs the menu and telling it where to paint. And the, Yes, question. This is uh, just some clip art that I had borrowed from the guy that taught me about this. I am, do not actually bother with shadows. It's just my simple example. Um, if you were doing calculating light sources, you would have to do shadow mapping, and you could do that by a depth buffer from the perspective of your light source and figure out what is deeper and deeper, or you could, um, uh, do written, like you were talking the ray tracing to figure out if something collides in the way. That was just a picture that I'd had. Um, so we also, actually, I'm going too far here. Uh, for the image buffer, so we test the depth buffer. If you're drawing closer, you actually draw the color of that pixel in on that spot. Um, well, and actually, yeah, let me explain a little bit more on that. After you've drawn all these different layers, you have the, your buffer that's on the screen that's currently being viewed, and then your final uh, buffer of what the next slide will look like, and you blast it on there all at once. If you were to actually be drawing on the screen for every single object, you'd see all the behind objects getting written over, and your screen would flash as it's, draw as it's filling in. Which you, you want to avoid flashing as much as possible. And I kind of talked about this already. If your depth is further back, you don't draw it. If it's in front, you do. And I had shown kind of a picture along these lines too. The surface maps to a region of, a, of your polygon on the screen. And it, if you rotate around your object and it's clear around the back or on the top, you have to map those coordinates to get stretched and flipped around also from your uh, surface or your texture. Um, for rasterization, the process of rasterization is you basically scan across every row, every pixel in every row on your object that you're gonna be drawing. Most times people just use a graphics engine that does this for them, but I wanted to learn exactly how it worked and make sure I got the math all right and understood it. And the easiest way to do that is, because of some math later, I actually divide a triangle into a two, two different triangles, and that way I can do some easier interpolation down the sides. So I find I, the least coordinate, the middle coordinate, and the bottom coordinate, and I cut across the middle. And so when I want to figure out First of all, you go through the depth. What is the depth of the point that you're looking at? And it's not that you can actually address into a particular triangle and say, what is the depth at this middle point? We know the depths, of the z-depth of the different points, and so we have to figure out, we're going down raster by raster, or row, uh, from the top, and it's, in this example here, we've gotten down to the green line and we want to go across. And so there's a interpolation di distance of we're this far between the coordinates on the screen. And these are the, my coordinates that I have of the depth at this corner and at this corner. And I interpolate down, I'm at, you know, 50% or whatever. And we calculate, so the different, that's a linear interpolation in three dimensions. The depth is, the Z at that point would I have marked as D1 prime. Um, and then I actually do the, uh, on the other side also, I don't actually know the depth at 
the where the line is broken in the middle where I cut the triangle apart. So I have between P1 and P2, and I interpolate there also at the same horizontal axis. And it from then I interpolated twice, once on each side. Now I have the depth here, and I can interpolate between them because I now know I'm doing the pixel that, say for example, 30% of the way across. And that will tell me the depth at that point. I would draw that into my depth buffer. Because they're nested routines, and I don't want to do extra math, at that exact same time, I go look up, well, and actually this, that's the bottom half. I'll get to that in a second. And that, so that would basically, ah, too many clicks. That gives me my depth for each, and I go through every polygon that's ever on that mesh, and that calculates the depth. And from visualization, darker is closer. And so that's how it looks. For the uh, applying the surface and the color, I do the very similar thing of doing the diagonal, the darker green square on the right is on what my triangle is for going on the screen, and I would be going straight across there, one row at a, or one pixel at a time in each row. But that doesn't map exactly to the way my triangle, my bitmap that I'm using is my surface. So I do an interpolation on the left side, an interpolation across the right side, that gives me the two points here. And then as I move across the green line on the uh, right side, where that red arrow is pointing to, that line in the original image ha may actually be a diagonal across your original source bitmap image. So I interpolate between those two for whatever the distance is for the interpolation of how far across that row I've gone. And that's going to pick out a point, and in this case, it's just a yellow pixel happens to be right above the top of the U. And I, if my depth is less than what my depth buffer was, I draw that pixel. Now, I talked about the, the top triangle. The bottom triangle is the same thing, but I interpolate across the bottom and the complete length on the side. Um, and basically the same routine again with the interpolation, double interpolation, and then the diagonal interpolation. And you do all know interpolation. Basically, it's a straight percentage of, if you're 50%, 30% down, you can apply that to a congruent triangle or what your source triangle is. You just basically figure out 30% down for knowing the coordinate at that point. So once you've uh, applied all the surfaces, gone through all the polygons, all of them are painted. Now here's where a mathematical flaw comes in with just doing straight percentages on interpolation. It's called a fine perspective error. And let me see. So normally, if we have a grid, and we would be drawing, so say for them, that from the 10% point to the 10% point over here, and the 20% point to the 20% point. If you look at the image when it's twisted, 10% here and 20% here, this distance of 10% on the each of these it happens whoops, because I happen to have 10 grids on here, or squares. I'm just using the numbers of 10%. It would be whatever proportion it was for every row that you were dealing with. It would, the diagonal 10% steps on that, on, a, on your hypotenuse, are much larger than they were on your original adjacent side. And... So here it goes down and it looks wide. It gets, looks like it gets wider and looks like it gets wider. I've driven, drawn the white line. The blue line is where that thing really should sh uh, shrink down to in uh, a normal perspective drawing. The white line is what mathematically happened because of the percentages. And if you notice in the image on the uh, right, it looks squished and there's a, across the middle, it's an error. There's a way of, when you're doing this interpolation of an additional cross-computing each point for the vectors, adjusting for some uh, appropriate perspectiveness 
uh, of them and it, the coordinates will work out much nicer. Uh, when I first gave this presentation, I happened to have a 3D expert uh, in there and I've looked up what the techniques are. It's uh, some co extra complicated math. It slows things down a little bit, but not too bad when you're doing the visualization. Uh, and I'll show you an example of where that actually comes up in, in the application. For my dummy application, I just declare a set of three sets of points, and those were my 3D points. This is the uh, bitmap image I'm using, and these are the 2D coordinates. The, uh, this object here would define the triangles for And this is 12 triangles that cover the six. You know, you get two on this side, two on this side, yada, yada. This is not how a professional CAD graphic system would do it. They would probably actually have a graphical artist do paint up something in a 3D system and they would dump an image of all those data points into a model file that then would be loaded into your 3D system and manipulate that model. This was just so I could do it from end to end. Well, and I, See, this one happens to be one bit Im, bitmap image that I'm using for each side. It's just as easy if you have, this is a square globe, and I cut this into 12 separate triangles. I can pull it out of the same bitmap face, and each coordinate for each face knows which triangle it's going to use out of this. If I get the ups or the from the, the right hand rule, right hand, sorry, um, backwards, different faces will show the wrong countries on the wrong sides, which is what the up image was showing before of some of the images being backward. So you have to be very careful about when you fold this map, this image around your shape that you're grabbing the right triangles out of it. This is just an optimization, not an optimization, but of using the same bitmap image to store all of your triangle surfaces in. Um, this is the, um, all the steps that are needed. If I have a model passed into me, say a cube, and I want to make a couple copies of the model and rotate it around in different positions and then place it in the world. So I got my model being passed in. I stretch it to a certain size, and I'll call it model X. I rotate my model X on the Z, and I call it model uh, Y. Model X again, rotate it again, and, and I call it Z. Then I would go to add these to my world mesh, and, and for this one, I want to rotate it by this particular angle and then move it off to the position I want to. And so this is an upper left, lower right, and all four quadrants. I have my point of view matrix, my field of view matrix, my viewport, and uh, this world are meshes and these are matrix. So when I just multiply these together collectively, these get made into one and multiplied by the world, as opposed to the extra many, many steps of multiplying the world by the point of view, multiplying the world by the uh, field of view, multiplying the world by the view. That uh, divide by W step, it's just called the perspective divide. That goes through in every point and does a divide by W. Then I return the screen object. It looks inefficient that I'm returning an entire world as a return parameter. RTO, return value optimization, or R, return RVO, um, makes this very quick and because it's not actually copying it. So. so these are the three objects by depth, or four objects, that I moved off in different positions. Some of them were pushed back, some of them were in the upper corner, and you can see how they kind of hide depth from each other. And this is what it looks like when it gets drawn with the ups in all the different directions. The yellow kind of does makes it doesn't show where the borders on there are very well. So let's look at the, our world object. And this is what if you had multiple worlds in front of each other. A, uh, something to realize is the human mind looks at a solid, what it thinks is a solid object, and it does not like it when two solid objects cross each other. 
This does not have a physics engine in it and doesn't care if you have two objects overlapping in the same physical space. Whatever is the, the closest surface will be the one that gets drawn. So I got a couple of demos here for you. So here's some wireframes of those four uh, uh, cubes that we're doing that are rotating, rotating across the uh, the y-axis, rotating across the uh, x-axis, rotating on the z-axis, and this one is an all three axis each time. And let me make it a little bigger for you. Um, this is what the depth buffer looks like. This object is closest, and these are further behind. If these objects is bigger, they actually collide and intersect. And like I say, there's no physics engine. It, it allows it to do that. And here's what a image looks like when they collide. There again, yellow is a little hard to see there. This is Frankie, my dog that uh, passed away this last year. And you may not see it real well at a higher speed. Let me slow it down. As he moves around, remember this is two different triangles for each face, and we get that perspective issue problem and stretch. If you watch his nose as he rotates around, it actually looks like it's moving because the image is getting stretched. And let's show it to you in the wire. Yeah, not really viewable in the wireframe. But to show you the different triangles that are here, we had our up cube. And we got Frankie. This is the mixed, half and half of the triangles. And so you can see how those are. You can also see how the images collide and overlap and how they kind of swallow each other up. If you want, if you have, if you also notice some of the words up or backwards, some of the Frankie image are, tra are transposed because they're actually looking at the back side of them. If we got rid of half of the images here, you'd be able to see through this and see it actually painting on the back side of the square. So you're actually looking through the image here uh, and being able to see some of the back sides, also see some of the intersections where they slice through each other. And do a little back at the faster speed. And if they make them overlap a little more, Apologies, this can really hurt the human mind to look at and see these things that look like daggers of the mind. Question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just was wondering. So, are you actually doing the uh, GFO for render to the screen, or are you using uh, DirectX or OpenGL to render the I am not. Uh, the question was, am I use, what graphics engine am I using to render to the screen? I'm doing this entirely in arrays of bitmaps or and it's color, color arrays and dumping that into a bitmap and blitting that straight on the screen. This is not using any graphics engine other than me doing all of the math myself and blitting these images directly on the screen. Okay. Yeah. Um, now here's that earth image that I was showing you before of wrapped around and, the, and if, if some of these were backwards, across the diagonals uh, on, of the, on the vertices, you would have Australia, and but then right around the corner from that, you know, it would be potentially colliding with North and South America, and it would be entirely you know, map, messed up world that Magellan would not have liked at all. Ah, something to tell you a little bit about here. This is entirely a single-threaded program. I could have optimized it and split some of the uh, calculation of the points and each of the um, uh, images, the frames, you know, across multiple thread and been calculating ahead. Uh, that's just more of an optimization. Right now, this is drawing at 28 frames per second and calculating 91 million pixels per second on a single threaded processor, which for a laptop, which runs at 1.7 gigahertz, that's pretty beefy for the amount of work it's doing. And it's pretty continuous in, in the way that it looks. Um, 
the more pixels are on there, the more work it has to do, which the frame rate will slow down a little bit. Um, I'm going to change these scales on these a little bit so they're a little bit more easily viewable. These are separate objects. And let's go back to Frankie. I like him better. Is that too dark for you guys to see on the screen? I heard some people were having issues with the de with depth. Let's go to Earth. That's re reasonably bright. And I was talking about your camera position and perspective and how that changed. We happen to be at a point of view of 0, 0, 100 back from this with a rotation of zero. If I move my camera from where my mouse is at now to over here, you can see how you're kind of looking at down on these objects in depth from different points. You get you know the X and the Y and the Z, or pardon me, the X and the Y. I also have a Z uh, where we can get closer and further back. And then for the camera view, my mouse positions on here was just an input method. It, they don't actually have any real importance to the graphics engine other than that's an import. You can also rotate, and this was the camera up position, or the way it's looking up this way or this way. And so I'm doing full 3D math and redrawing all these vectors every single time, every pixel is getting redrawn on the screen here. If you needed to have a game where you had an entire background that you were drawing, you might calculate that once, and then objects in front of it calculate those every frame. You would do those and then add them together uh, in, a, in a world and then apply your transforms. So you didn't have to recalculate every one of those points for that you were placing in your world for all the different objects in the background and whatnot. Uh, I think I've hit pretty much all the points I wanted to um, on my presentation. Did it, did it, yes, question. Um, so, did you want to uh, include it so that you had like smoother rotations? Did you implement a uh, uh, rotating square system or rotating quaternion uh, so that you can have that smoother, uh, smoother uh, rotation? Uh, yeah, the question was about optimizations of smoothing out the rotation. I happen to have just the timer going that increments a certain set of degrees for each frame. Um, and he was asking about several particular type of smoothing me mechanisms. I don't, I don't know those very well, so I cannot give an answer. That would be an op option. The reason this, you see a little teensy bit of jitter on this is each frame it's moving at increment of angles. And I could do those a lot smaller, so it'd be a lot closer together and smoother but the, because of the frame rate, it would make the object look like it was rotating slower. Question. So, do you need to look up table for two fragments of time? It goes for the rotation, two different dots, fragments of time, floating point operations, right? Well, I don't do very much math on that, and let me kill this and go back to the slideshow. Because I only do, I only ever actually have to do that once per calculating. Um, um, whoops! It started at the beginning. But but I but I only have to look it up once per matrix when I declare rotation. Um, uh, for a matrix that, did I repeat the question appropriately? He was asking about if I should use a sine, a, a lookup table for calculating sine and cosine. Well, it needs to get on the video. Um, if it, that's, uh, would be making things a lot faster. Okay, the, um, the only time I have to look up a sine and cosine, if someone wants to rotate something, I only have to look it up once. In this example uh, here, you got the A, C, and B value. Those are here, you got the cosine, sine, and then the opposite 
the negation of the sine side. So it's only looking up once per uh, matrix. The matrix I multiply together to be that combined matrix, and then I multiply that across all the points. I do not recreate that matrix every single time. I only do it the very first time when someone says what angle they want to rotate it to. Yeah. And on certain platforms, you could do the lookup yourself. Uh, the C library actually has a reasonably fast sine cosine, and sine and cosine are really the same thing, just a few degrees, you know, nine degrees out of phase with each other. So, but um, it, in this case, it really doesn't make any difference, and, and, I, and I would probably suffer more from inaccuracy uh, in in the lookup table and the extra work of having to interpolate between rows in a lookup table for what sine cosine value would be. The library is good at it; let it do its job. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Right. It, it, same math. Yeah, it's the same math. This is exactly all the work the GPU would be doing for you or Unity or whatever. The only optimizations I have applied here are straight mathematical uh, optimizations that the compiler supplies when multiplying together numbers. There is no, uh, I'm not offloading this to the graphics coprocessor to do all the transforms and that type of stuff. And the point that I had to figure out forgot to echo this for the question, for the screen. Uh, the point was, everything I'm doing here is exactly the same math that GPU is doing. That when, you off, when you download an image to the graphics processor and it would be doing all these different transforms. I could have, you know, just hit, <coughs> taken my set of points and uh, offloaded to it, to the GPU, and it would do all that stuff for me. I wanted to know how it worked. I don't like magic. I don't, I don't want to have someone do the work for me. I can't understand it right if I don't know how, to, how it works. This is not using the GPU at all. Not at all. What I'm actually, what I'm doing there is actually, I don't want to say violating the laws of physics, but I'm simultaneously rotating on X, Y, and Z. But that's a that's a, a question was do I end up with gimbal lock, uh, being that I'm rotating in multiple axes at the same time? And the truth is, I'm not really rotating in multiple axes at the same time. I rotated by X and then by Z or by Y and then by Z. The order of the matrices that you multiply them together is the order that those are actually applied in your final operation. So it looked like I was doing them all at the same time, but the order is dependent in the, in the matrix, in the order of the matrix multiplication. Further question, question, Jeff. Oh no, he's gonna catch me on something. Yes. Ah, slideware. Okay, Jeff's question was, why didn't I bother to display, you know, put them in one of their const or, and in, in some cases, did I actually put in references? Yeah, I did put in references here. Um, everything in my math libraries is const correct where appropriate. And it was just so it would fit on the slide, because if I did all the extra const and stuff, it would get too wide for the screen. Okay, do I pass, Jeff? Okay, thank you. <laughs> or at least as far as you know. Oh, yeah. And also, um, I have not yet had a chance to uh, put these slides or the uh, code for this up on the GitHub. I will do that and attach that to the uh, presentation when it gets posted online, which you can then be able to download and play with as you want. It is not a perfect example. That, um, but I wanted to also just say everything I'm doing in my render library could be done on Windows or Linux just as long as you had the appropriate graphics device to draw it into. And we're basically out of time, but I'll take one question. Oh, 
the perspective divide at those points when you're the numbers that are in the matrices and in the, all the points look like total garbage before this perspective divide. I mean, there may be like 9,000 something, and by the time you do the perspective divide, it brings you back to 90 or something or whatever, you know. And it's probably some really uh, weird uh, floating point number. Oh, that's the other interesting point. These are not calculated using doubles. The doubles have way too much more precision than you need. Um, and floats work a lot faster. On graphics cards, and this is more of historical, not necessarily current, floats give you enough resolution because you don't need 17 digits of resolution when you're only really concerned about the major significant figures. And it saves a lot of storage to do things in storm in uh, four bytes as opposed to eight. Okay, Beta tells me we're out of time. So, thank you very much. <laughs>